Well, I, um, uh, the skit we had here er is a total work of fiction. Nobody plays Monopoly in a cutthroat fashion, and everybody just asks and says, good move. Um, actually, you know, it, it is, it, it, it's hard to imagine a household in which there hasn't been one of those long, drawn-out, wonderful Monopoly games. Although I'm told that Monopoly can be played in 90 minutes or less if you get rid of all the rules that families have added. You know, like, like the money, there's no, there's no rule about putting money in the middle that you get when you land on free parking. And there's a number of rules that people think are there and aren't. But either way, uh, uh, you know, it is, it is a uh, common experience to have played Monopoly. And indeed, uh, the story of how it was made is a heartwarming story. If we can have our first slide right here. Uh, Charles Darrow, according to the story, during the height of the Depression, invented this game. And this is, in, uh, the in one particular museum, the first uh, Monopoly board. It's real. You can see Chad Notion with money, thought could win deal, and a certain brief game because they took these beat my product so as uh, they decided to publish the game. They sold over 100,000 copies this year, over a million copies the second year, and Bradley on the verge of Europe and everybody happily ever a story as things continue to sell. Uh, you can buy all kinds of versions. I think at home they have light, Lighthouseopoly and uh, mixed versions as well. Your house. The thing is, this, this story of its invent totally wrong, and Milton Bradley knew it, which is why, if you'll go to the second slide, they paid Lizzie Maggie a big 500 bucks for the rights to the game she invented 30 years earlier in 1902, patented and manufactured in 1906. Lizzie Maggie was a progressive writer in favor of unions and a very skeptical about the capitalist system. If we go to the third slide, she invented something called the landlord's game, which is recognizably monopoly. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a free park, not free parking. You get 100 bucks every time you go around the circuit. There are properties, there are utilities, there are railroads, and there are two ways to play. One of them, you are, you, it's called the landlord's game, and you play in a cutthroat fashion. Everybody else has to go bankrupt in order for you to win. But in order to teach children, life isn't that way necessarily. The other version played on the same board is called prosperity. Everybody has 10 turns around the board, and there's no reason that everybody can't end the game with properties, with money in the bank. Uh, you do pay if you, if you buy certain luxury items, uh, there'll be a long-term cost, but the point of her game was to teach children we can all win. We might not end up with the same amount of money. We might not all make the same choices. Let's go to the last slide, but we can win. And this is then another version of her game as it was published. You can see the chance up there and other things like that, luxury taxes. You know, it, uh, when, when Milton Bradley decided to publish Darrow's game, which was clearly stolen from Maggie's game, uh, they, uh, as I said, paid her 500 bucks for her version. Uh, Darrow's game is based on one of the copies uh, of the landlord's game that was uh, made by Quakers in the Philadelphia area, and they were the ones who decided to put all the names of the uh, streets from New Jersey from the boardwalk onto, uh, 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 into the game itself. Uh, you know, the, the game itself, when we think of all the anger, all the upset boards, all, all the games that end with people not talking to each other, you, know, you have to ask yourself, as Jesus did his disciples, what does it profit you to win the whole world and bankrupt everyone else and lose your own soul? It's really a very important question. Okay, we can take the pictures off now. Uh, and by the way, the book about this was just published this past week, but there's been articles about it leading up to it for weeks and weeks, which is why I've been fascinated in reading every article I could on the subject. Uh, it is a fascinating thing, and I... Um, you know, we, Jesus in the New Testament asks economic questions. So often, some terms are trans spiritual terms, but the words we see in the Greek New Testament 
are financial. And in one of these key verses, what it really says is, what kind of investment is it? What kind of investment is it to gain the whole world and then lose your own identity, your own spirit, or sometimes your own soul? What does it profit us to put, to invest everything, to win at all costs, and then no longer be ourselves by the end of the game, by the end of our life, by the end of our choices? That's really what Jesus is asking here. This scripture begins with Jesus beginning to speak about the true cost, the true investment of discipleship. As he says that the son the son of man will be uh, will suffer and will be opposed by the elders and the priests and the writers and they will kill him and in 3 days he will rise again. They're not getting it and as a matter of fact Peter quietly takes Jesus aside and says you don't want to be talking about this. This is not going to be good for your poll numbers. This isn't going to sell. People don't, want to, people don't want to get to the end of Candyland and find out that everybody wins, that, that your self-sacrifice is to save the whole world. People don't want to save the whole world. They want a nice, cozy heaven where it's me and my friends and some of my relatives <laughs> and nobody else. You know, amazingly, there are people who, who think that God... In gazing at a world of over 7 billion people simply wants to consign most of them to everlasting torment. That that's God's great aim. And yet this audacious experiment by God to get our attention, to seem to lose the game in order to win everything and win everybody, it doesn't seem to sell well. And so Peter chides him, and Jesus comes right back and says, get you behind me, Satan, or tempter, because you're, you're, you're frontal lobing, you're thinking uh, not about God things, but about human things. And then he had took everybody to the side and said, as, you, know, if, uh, you know, if you wish to be one of mine, then you have to do for others. And pick up your own cross and follow me. Now, that had to be one of the most obscene things that he could have said. Because, you know, the idea of picking up your cross, of, of crucifixion, uh, you know, of a form of execution that was not only horrible, but meant to eradicate any record that you'd ever lived. You know, your body destroyed, your identity destroyed, nothing left of you at all. Uh, you know, that's hardly a selling point. And yet... Jesus says, this is the way, because after all, what kind of investment would it be if you were to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? We, so often, people tell us that there's just not enough to go around, that we'd better get ours, and we better make sure that we're the winners and everybody else are the losers, when it's clear there is enough to go around, that we're smart enough to improve the way, and we have been smart enough to improve the way we grow crops, and that we have the ability to share around the world, and that there is enough money to go around, that when Camp Mac wants to retire alone, when churches want to do more in the world, that the money is there. But we are taught that there's only so many winners and everybody else is a loser. You know, as it says elsewhere, you know, uh, God did not come, did not send his son into the world in order to condemn the world, but that the whole cosmos, the whole universe might be saved. That's the plan. It's there in black and white. What kind of investment do you make in the people around you? What kind of investment do you make in your own life? Is it kill or be killed? Is it my way or the highway? Is it everyone else must be bankrupt so I can walk away from the game of life and have enough 
to leave behind when I'm dead and can't take it with me? What game are you playing? <sighs> the people are learning it's important, I think, not only for us to win, but for everyone to win with us. That when Jesus is raised on high in suffering and death, that the whole world is taken up with him into glory. It's kind of like a very trite little poem, most of which people don't know, but by Grantland Rice, the sports writer. He wrote a poem called Alumnus Football in which he, he warned people that were football stars that life would be a lot harder. They might not do as well economically as they thought, but very important how you lived your life. And you may be familiar with the last stanza. For when the one great scorer comes to write against your name, he'll not write if you won or lost, but how you played the game. Pretty simple, pretty trite, but pretty important. And when the one great scorer comes to write against your name, he'll not write if you won or lost, but how you played the game. That's what matters in the long term. Victories are fun. Competition is important to bring out the best in us. But in the long run, we're judged by the people who, after suffering a devastating loss, get up and shake the hands of their opponents. We're judged by how we do during times of trouble, not during times of prosperity. And we think highly of those who are gracious enough to find a way for everyone to win. It's economic. It's spiritual. And it's life. Uh, about eight years after she sold the rights for the game, the landlord's game, to Milton Bradley in the census form, uh, Lizzie Maggie wrote uh, under her profession, uh, game inventor. And where it said how much she had earned inventing games, of which she had many, she put zero dollars for that year. Uh, she simply did not make a lot of money. But she certainly showed the way to how we should all live and the kind of victory that God seeks for us, which is to have everybody a part of it, everyone a winner, and everyone recognizing they are loved and loved by God. That's the important thing. I would say to us all, let's play to win, and let's play so everyone wins. Amen. Oh, and, and normally, this was hard. The triplets are normally getting along all the time and are sweet to each other. They had to really act uh, to make this skit work, and I want to thank them for that. It was tough. It was tough. Join me in benediction. This is a new song, and Nancy's going to play it through. If some of you like to read your music and look at your notes, you could turn in the hymnal for 512. It's, it's a little different. It's not 